a couple of weeks ago, I got a new laptop after five years. And I, I would have to tell you honestly that um, I enjoyed the experience of unwrapping the box, taking the laptop up, and firing it up more than would be reasonable. I enjoyed it more than is, is appropriate, I would say. Um, and to be honest, I'm still loving my laptop day by day. It is smaller, lighter, faster, cleaner than my old laptop. The battery life is amazing. I occasionally, you know, you can click to check how long you've got left. I occasionally click just to see that I've got more than 10 hours. How good is that? More than 10 hours left. My old battery life was like 45 minutes. And, and all the keys work. That was, the, that was the tipping point in my old laptop, was the W key went. Um, actually, when I was writing the questions for Inspar Holiday Club. So I was trying to write who, what, where, why, how, but I didn't have a W key that worked. So that was, that was pretty annoying. Um, so all the keys work. Battery life's great. I love it, right? We love new stuff. We love new tech, I love my new laptop, right? Or um, my wife said, I, you, know, you can probably see looking at me that it's not clothes for me, but I understand that for some people it's clothes, right? So, so you're feeling a bit stuck in a rut, you're feeling um, just a bit samey, and so you think, right, I'll go online, have a look for a new dress, I pick up a new dress, I order it, it comes through, and it fits great, and so you, you wear it out, and you feel great, you feel kind of new, right? We love new stuff, whether it's new tech or new clothes, or even just the feel of like when you get new bed sheets out of the wrapper, and put them on the bed, and that's a, that's a great feeling, right? We love new stuff. And I think we love new stuff because it, it gives us this sense, this possibility of making ourselves new in some way, right? So it's not just that my laptop is clean and shiny. It's that it's going to turn me into a super productive individual, right? Now I'm not restrained by cables. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to smash work day by day, right? It's not just that the dress is nice. It's that it's going to turn me into the beautiful, glamorous person as I head out in the evening that I always wanted to be, right? We love that sense of that, that possibility of, of, of newness in our life. And it might just be me. My sense is that we're all particularly aware of that right now, right? So coming off the back of the summer holidays into a new academic year is one thing, but coming off 18 months of COVID, it does feel like there's a proper reset, right? A chance to ask, what do I want my life to look like? On some level, who do I want to be? Which parts of myself do I want to say, well, that was only me pre-COVID? And the new post-COVID me looks like this. We love that possibility of renewal in our lives. But does it last? Or sooner or later, does it just feel like it's the same old me? Um, today's passage speaks deeply into that desire we have for renewal. In our lives, it speaks a word of warning um, in verses three, sorry, chapter three, verses one to twenty, and then it speaks a word of deep and transformative hope in the second part of the passage, three twenty-one through to four thirteen. Um, but first, a word of warning, uh, chapter three, verses one to twenty. So, um, as we start Luke chapter three, we've moved about thirty years, or almost exactly thirty years forward in time from chapters one and two, where Luke recorded the historical events of the birth of Jesus and of, of John the Baptist. And as Luke kind of kicks off this new section, he's, he's so keen that we see again that this is rooted in real history. That's the only way you can make sense of, of, of Luke, one and two, Luke chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, right? Look down with me. In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, Herod, tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Te Philip, tetrarch of Eturia and Trachonitis, and Lysanias, tetrarch of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, right, so he's lining up all these names and all these places to show that what's going to follow is not a myth, it's not made up, it's what happened in this real place at this real time in real history. But what's interesting is that all those, all those big names, right, all those famous important figures, the rulers, the, the, the Caesars even, the high priests, we don't hear anything else about them. They're, they're just scenery. They're just backdrop, right? The action is there in verse 2. The word of God came to John, son of Zechariah in the wilderness. That's where the action is. God is on the move. His word has come to John so that at this time, in this place, John might fulfill Isaiah's prophecy from over 500 years earlier. That John might be, as verse 4 says, a voice calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. John is called by God to be a voice a voice preparing people for the coming of their God, that the rescue and the salvation of God is coming and the people need to be ready. What does it look like to be ready? Well, verse three, John went into all the country around the Jordan preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. So being ready 
for God and his return is about a fresh start. (laughs) It's about being baptized, John says, as a picture of a forgiveness, a washing away of sin, and and a a sign of repentance, a turning away from sin and back to God. But but the the word of warning, the shock for us, comes down in verse 7, where we see John speaking to the crowds. Uh, Look down with me at verse 7, page 1029. John said to the crowds coming out to be baptized with him, right, what do you think John would say, right? If John had been trained in like um, building a church school, like, like getting a church going, you'd say, John said to the crowds coming out to be baptized by him, guys, so great that you're here. I'm so pleased that you come to be baptized. Once you've been baptized, you're going to be refreshed, you're going to be renewed, you're going to be ready for the coming of God. What does John say? You brood of vipers. Who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. The axe has been laid to the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. It's pretty brutal, right? It's it's brutally strong language. And it flows from God, John's fiery love for the people who've come to be baptized. John's fiery love compels him to warn them that any surface level superficial renewal just won't cut it. So, so coming to be baptized is a good thing. But John's saying, don't, don't for a minute think that a one-off washing with water is going to fix it. I don't know what it is for us. Don't for a minute think that, in some sense, just deciding that you're going to get better at reading your Bible, that one decision and that one action is going to fix it. Or that deciding to eat healthily, that's going to fix it. Or deciding that you're going to be better at keeping up with your friends, that's going to fix it. We can, we can try all these superficial surface level, I'm going to do this thing differently. But it doesn't work, it doesn't last. Because surface level renewal, it's like it rubs off over time, right? We've just put a new coat on, or a new face on, a new mask on, it rubs off over time, right? Just like the nice, my nice clean laptop screen is going to get grubby over time, right? And in a few weeks, it's just my laptop. It's not my new laptop anymore. Or just like you, you've got that dress, and a few months later, there's a couple of threads missing, and it's, to be honest, it's not that new dress anymore. It's just that same old dress. Well, in the same way, if we, if we go for that kind of superficial surface level renewal, sooner or later, months or weeks, it's just going to be me again. So John, and, and it's not just, it's not just that, that it doesn't work, but the surface level renewal actually doesn't cut it with God either. John warns the people and he warns us that God is not distracted by us sorting ourselves out on the surface. God is not distracted by our religious credentials. I went to church last week. God sees our hearts, our deepest motives, our deepest desires, what we're really like. And the warning from John, the solemn warning, is that unless we change at that level, in the roots, the core of our being, God's wrath, his his considered right judgment on sin, on selfishness, on the damage we do to others, that that wrath is coming. The axe has been laid to the root of the trees. The root of the trees. What we're really like. And so, John says, we we need to bear fruit, produce fruit in keeping with repentance. And I think that picture that John uses of fruit is really helpful. Because because for a tree to bear fruit, it's got to have healthy roots. You know that a tree is healthy if it's bearing fruit, but but it needs those roots. You can't just fix it on the surface, right? And it's slow, right? You can't just kind of tie fruit to a tree. That's not how it works. The fruit has to develop. It's going to be slow and and, and time-consuming. And so the question is, what is this deep, slow, true renewal really like? That's what the people ask John. They say, what should we do then? You say produce fruits and keep the repentance. What should we do? Verse 11, John answered them, anyone who has two shirts should share with the one who has none. And anyone who has food should do the same. I've got two shirts and I've got food. I don't know about you. True renewal bears fruit in generosity, a life of generosity that doesn't need riches to start being generous, but says, I've got two shirts and that guy has none. I've got some food and that guy has none. 
true generosity and a life of integrity. So the tax collectors and the, the soldiers come to John. And these are the guys who are on the, on the margin of society because they're the collaborators. They're the ones working with the Roman occupation. And the other thing they've got in common is that they both have jobs where it's really easy to exploit other people. And John doesn't say to them, guys, your jobs are, are, are just not good jobs. You should, you should leave them behind and come and kind of live in a desert monastery thing with me. He calls them to a life of integrity in the mess of the world. Not withdrawing from it, but living, in a, in, living a life of integrity in it. So to the tax collector, he says, don't collect more than your own. Do your job, do it with integrity, don't exploit people. To the soldiers, he says, don't use your power, your, your violent force that you have to exploit people. Live with integrity, moment by moment, day by day, decision by decision. That's what true renewal looks like on this, as it works its way out, John says. True generosity and true integrity. Now, I don't know about you, but that, to me, sounds a lot more beautiful, a lot more compelling than a surface-level renewal, right? Than a life of, of, of religious activity and trying to do the occasional good deeds. But it also sounds a lot harder. Because on our own strength, we can tweak our lives around the edges. But can we bring ourselves into that, kind of rene- that true renewal? Can we truly produce fruit? in keeping with repentance? Can we live lives of consistent generosity rather than just giving some money to church or charity in a relatively painless way? And maybe, you know, we see someone on the street and in an act of basically feeling a bit guilty, we give some money. Can we live lives of consistent integrity in our own strength rather than just treating people nicely because we want them to like us so we get we what we want? Not in our own strength. Not on our own. <laughs> but the really good news, the really good news for all of us this afternoon is that God doesn't just have a word of warning for us. No, he wants to speak to us of his saving son. The saving son. That's the second part um, of the passage today. And what we see in Jesus' uh, baptism, in his genealogy, that's just a fancy word for family tree, and his testing in the wilderness, what we see in those things it is nothing less than a new start for humanity. What we see in those things is nothing less than the source of true renewal for you and for me. So let, let's look together. Let's start with his baptism. Uh, Luke chapter 3, verse 21, still on page 1029. When all the people were being baptized, Jesus was baptized too. And as he was praying, heaven was opened. And the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my son whom I love. With you I am well pleased. Jesus was baptized too. I love that. Jesus was baptized too. He, he had no sin. Nothing to be forgiven for. He'd never turned away from his father. He had no need to repent. And yet he was baptized too with the brood of vipers with the people who'd come to John in their sin and their surface level renewal, because Jesus said, I'm going to identify myself with you, with us, with humanity and our sinfulness. Jesus says, I have come to be one of you. But at the same time, he's revealed in his baptism to be a man like no other. A man in whom heaven, the dwelling place of God, is opened up to the earth. A man filled with the spirit, the very life and love of God. A man declared to be the divine son with whom God is well pleased, whose relationship with his father is perfect and unbroken. That is who Jesus is. And what Luke wants to show us in the the family tree that follows is that this man like no other, this Jesus does represent a fresh start, a new start for the whole of humanity. So uh, we weren't able to have the whole thing read, just for reasons of time. I'm sure Tom was gutted not to have to make his way through all of those names. You can see it on page 1030. It's a, it would be tough reading. There we go. But, but here's the point. What's, what's striking about Luke's genealogy is how far back he goes. So if you kind of you just scan, scan over lots of names, lots of things you couldn't pronounce, bam, 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 all the way back. Verse 38, end of the genealogy. Where are we? We're with Adam. Adam, the son of God, Luke says. 
And by calling Adam the son of God, by going all the way back to Adam and then saying Adam the son of God, Luke's very clearly drawing a connection for us between Adam and Jesus, the two people he's called the son of God, right? Adam, as the son of God, stands at the head and as the source of the whole of that old humanity in its sinfulness. And Jesus, as the son of God, as the second Adam, the last Adam, he stands at the head and source of a whole new humanity. He identifies with the old humanity. Verse 23 says it was thought that he was the son of Joseph, the son of 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 Adam. But in reality, as the son of God, he is, he is bringing into to being, he is himself the source of a truly renewed humanity. And then what we get to see is that, humanity in, that new humanity in action. And as Jesus is tested in the wilderness, what we see is that this new humanity, this person, the Lord Jesus Christ, succeeds where the old humanity failed. So the wilderness was the place of testing for God's people, Israel, in the Old Testament. And God called his people, Exodus 4, 22. He said, Israel's my firstborn son. So God, God rescues his son out of Egypt, that's the Exodus, and then they spend 40 years in the wilderness. And they are not faithful to their father, right? Read Exodus, read Leviticus, read Numbers, read Deuteronomy, it piles up. They worship other gods. They worship idols. They don't depend on God. They test him. They don't trust him. Time and time again, they fail. The firstborn son fails. The old humanity fails. And then Jesus here, the firstborn son, the son of God, the new humanity, he succeeds. 40 days, 40 there again, in the wilderness, being tested by the devil. But Jesus resists temptation. Jesus maintains a perfect relationship with his Father of worship, of trust, of obedience. He was truly fully human, weak like us, hungry, verse 2 tells us, hungry as we would have been after 40 days of no food, and yet he resisted. He kept on worshipping and trusting and depending on his father. But the greatest test was actually yet to come. Verse 13 tells us that when the devil had finished all this tempting, he left Jesus until an opportune time. So not forever. Until an opportune time, until another moment. When's that moment? It's the night before the cross. It's the Garden of Gethsemane. As Jesus is abandoned by his friends and, puts, and, and, and faces and can see before him on his path the full horror of the cross. And Jesus' worship and obedience and trust to his father is put to the test, to the limit. His, his generosity in his giving of himself for us, his, his integrity in his faithfulness to his mission, they're all put to the test, they're all tested to the limit. And yet, where the first Adam failed in the Garden of Paradise, the last Adam succeeds in the Garden of Darkness. Jesus walks unswervingly to the cross, giving himself for you and for me. That's what this new humanity looks like, really looks like. In his book um, on the Incarnation, the fourth century theologian, um, Athanasius, asks his readers to imagine a portrait it's a picture of a person. And he's saying, imagine this portrait, but imagine that something's gone horribly wrong. And this portrait has been really badly damaged. It's stained, it's scratched, it's marred, so that you can't actually see who it is of anymore. Athanasia says that's what humanity is like. Made in the image of God, but in our sin and our rebellion, our turning away from God and his call, we've, we've messed ourselves up so badly that we can't really see anymore. And so our attempts to renew ourselves are like taking a brush and going, maybe if I just kind of redo the eye on that, that'll, that'll fix it. Or maybe if I just repoint the chin a little bit, that, it's not going to work. Instead, Athanasius asks, what will the artist do? Will they just throw away the whole thing? Put it in the bin, start again? No, Athanasius says, the subject of the portrait has to come and sit for it again. And then the likeness is redrawn on the same material even so it was with the Son of God. 
So Athanasius is saying that in Jesus, God the master artist isn't chucking humanity away. He is repainting humanity, renewing humanity in the person of Jesus. So that in Jesus we see what humanity is supposed to look like. Our own human efforts at renewal and our own strengths, like trying to kind of touch up a corner of a destroyed painting, Jesus is a renewing, a repainting of humanity. And so the question is how can we get in on it? How can we share, participate in this humanity that, that, that is inaugurated in Christ, that is begun in Him? Or to put it another way, how can we see deep and true renewal in our lives? The answer is by the power of the Holy Spirit. By the power of the Holy Spirit. Because as we look at this picture of renewed humanity, we see the Spirit. Verse 22 of chapter 3, the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. Chapter 4, verse 1, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, was left at the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Jesus is anointed by the Spirit. He's filled with the Spirit. He's led by the Spirit, and then he fights temptation with the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, Ephesians 6, 17. And the really good news is Jesus will give us that same Spirit, his Spirit, the Spirit of the, the one true God, as we come to him for forgiveness of sins, as we come to in repentance, we can share in that spirit. That's what John's saying. John knows that water isn't enough. John knows that his ministry isn't enough. Chapter 3, verse 16, John says, I baptize you with water. (laughs) But to realize what you really need, but one who is more powerful than I will come, and he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Through the gift of the Holy Spirit, we can share in the deep and true renewal of humanity that is embodied and enacted in the life of Jesus. But how does that work in the nitty-gritty of day-to-day life, right? So I'm I'm saying, you know, it's not about trying to renew ourselves, make ourselves new. No, God's word says no, it's it's about being renewed by his spirit as as we share in the life of Christ. But what does that look like tomorrow morning, Right? What does that look like when you're saying, I want to be patient with the kids? What does it look like when you head to work and you want to live with integrity in an office that makes that really hard? What does that look like tomorrow evening as you're there on your own thinking, what does it look like for me to use this time wisely? What does it look like to be renewed by the Spirit? What's the difference between making ourselves new and being renewed by the Spirit? We need to cultivate presence and dependence. God is with us and we need him. It starts by cultivating presence, right? God really is with us by his spirit. If we trust in the Lord Jesus, we have the very life and love of God dwelling within us wherever we are, whatever time it is. God is not in a box. He's not in a box labeled church. He's not in a box labeled my quiet time on a, on a 15 minutes in the morning that we go into and then come out of. He's really truly with us. And like, I'm sure for, for most of us here, we know that in our heads, but do we live as that, as if that's true? Like, is God in, in our peripheral vision, so to speak? And as we cultivate that presence, we cultivate dependence. Someone trying to renew themselves says, I must be more generous. Someone being renewed by the Spirit says, Father, help me to be more generous. I need your help. Um, let me give you a concrete example. So if I'm at home um, with my wife, Rose, and our little daughter, Miriam, who's just turned 19 months, um, Rose will default to her mum, right? So if Rose wants a book read, it's mummy's number one choice, right? If Rose wants to play with her trains, mummy, mummy's number one choice. And so that means if I want to rest, I just have to do nothing. If I just sit still and stay quiet, Rose is going to have to pick up the, the slack, right? But I don't want to be that guy. I don't want to be that guy. I want to love Rose and I want to love Miriam. But honestly, if I'm tired and God isn't in my peripheral vision and I'm sitting there thinking, I should, sorry, I'm sitting there thinking I should do something. I should go, I should offer, I should, oh, I'm tired. Doesn't work. If, if I'm aware of God's presence 
And that leads me to prayer, and I say, God, please help me to love Rose and love Miriam right now. I'm really tired. Please help me. I go. Not every time. Far from it. But I'm empowered by the Spirit, renewed by the Spirit, to become more the person I want to be and more the person God made me to be. So to share in the new humanity of Jesus, to be renewed in our inner being, to be renewed by the power of the Spirit, we need to live in the presence and dependence on God. And and that kind of life flows from and is expressed in prayer. And by that, I I don't mean shopping list prayer. God, please can I have this? Please do this. Please help. That that kind of, I'm just getting through that. Or or even um, thank you prayers. God, thank you for this. Or even praying for other people. All of those are good things. Good things to pray for. What, 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 What we're talking about here is a A prayer that is a living relationship with God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. An openness to his work, to hearing from him in our lives, speaking to him, wanting to to, to cultivate that that peripheral vision. Did you notice that it's when Jesus prays that heaven is opened? 3.22, as Jesus was praying, heaven was opened. And the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you are my son, whom I love with you, I'm well pleased. It's as Jesus prays that heaven's opened. It's as Jesus prays that the Spirit descends. It's as Jesus prays that he hears those words of love from his father. I have no idea what Jesus said. I'd love to know. What I do know is that his desire is that we would pray with him. We would share in his life. And that we would be renewed by his spirit. Let's pray together. Father, I pray that out of your glorious riches you might strengthen us with power through your spirit in our inner being. So that Christ may dwell in our hearts through faith that we might be made new for your glory. Amen.